Welcome to part three, reversing insulin resistance. In this presentation, we build heavily on parts one and two, so please watch those if you haven't already. As a quick recap, type two diabetes is a combination of insulin resistance and insulin underproduction, leading to the well-known rise in blood glucose used to both diagnose and monitor the condition. These two factors also lead to a range of lesser known consequences that affect both physical and mental health, which we address a little bit in part one. In part two, we covered the drivers of insulin resistance. So now we're going to look at what to do with that information to reverse the problem. You may wonder why there isn't a presentation on improving insulin production. And there are two reasons. One is that chronically high insulin is itself not really good for health. And two, when you improve insulin sensitivity, insulin production often improves too. So, what can you do to help the green sensitivity side of this tug of war win over the red or resistance side, and thereby restore your health? Everyone gets told to lose weight, and that helps. It can help a lot, but it's not the place to start. Start by taking some time to relax. The less time you spend in the fight or flight stress state, the more easily your body will regulate itself to be healthy. And that includes making it easier to get rid of fat in and around your organs. It's worth making a distinction between mindless sedentary time like collapsing on the couch and channel flicking, or forced sedentary time due to work or other commitments and the intentional relaxation, such as seated or lying meditation, or physically active relaxation, such as Tai Chi, or a restorative yoga class, or even quiet time in nature. The idea here is not to break a sweat or to strain, but to slow down racing thoughts without relying on something else to distract you. This is one of those things where the harder it is to do or make time for, the more important it is to do and find time for. As well as taking time for focused relaxation, it's also important, in the words of the immortal James Brown, get up off of that thing. Be more active. Humans, for the most part, are built for motion. We're meant to move, move well, and move often. When we don't, we sacrifice our health. And in turn, poor health can make it hard to be more active. Thinking we have to do strenuous exercise to benefit can really drain our motivation to do anything at all. The good news is that being more active isn't just about doing exercise. It's about getting off the chair, out of the seat, or off the sofa, frequently, and thereby break up the time we spend sedentary. Non-exercise physical activity can therefore range from getting up for some water to walking, cycling, or otherwise traveling under our own steam. Use the stairs if and when possible. Get into the housework, the gardening and the landscaping. Do things by hand and avoid labor-saving devices. If you're up to it, swap the trolley for a couple of grocery baskets. Even if you do exercise regularly, it's still worth making a conscious effort to be as active as often as possible outside of exercise. That's because many people unknowingly compensate for the exercise they do by becoming less active while they're not exercising. In other words, they may exercise, but then become even more sedentary the rest of the time. By making a conscious effort to be more active, you'll also optimize the benefits of any exercise you do. And speaking of exercise, it really is the best and possible only way to effectively improve the insulin sensitivity of your muscles. Dietary changes just don't do that very well. Exercise also improves liver insulin sensitivity. So that covers the two major players in blood glucose control. Any exercise is better than none, and the exercise you do regularly, even if it seems modest, is better than something you do only on the odd occasion. The thing with exercise is that the effects wear off quite quickly. High intensity activities, 
activities you could only do for several seconds to a few minutes before needing to rest, improve insulin sensitivity the most, especially for the amount of time invested. This makes things like interval training, also sometimes called high intensity intermittent training, a good option for improving insulin sensitivity. Even with such a potent effective form of exercise, the effect of insulin sensitivity wears off within about 48 to 72 hours, and that means frequency is important. The options and combinations are nearly limitless, especially if you add non-exercise physical activity into the mix. You can do interval training, resistance training, classic aerobic exercise, and you can do these in a group with a friend or by yourself. A routine is great. Just make sure within that routine you have some variety. The more qualities you train, such as strength, endurance, coordination and balance, the more your overall health and function will improve and the more fun you're likely to have. So how does exercise help? Well, by using some of the stored glucose in the muscle being exercised, those muscles become hungry for glucose and more readily take glucose out of your blood, both with and without the help of insulin. Because the effect is localized to the muscles actually being worked, it's more beneficial to do activities that use a lot of muscle mass. Activities that use the large muscles of our legs and back are ideal. There's nothing wrong with also doing something with our chest, shoulders, arms and midsection, but these should be worked in addition to the legs and back, rather than being the sole focus of any exercise we do. We have several modules looking at exercise on the Built for Motion website, so please watch those to better understand how you can exercise most effectively, and also how to hit the right level and amount of exercise between under and over doing things. Living with type 2 diabetes can be challenging and even isolating. Good social support can really help. It's often said that we are the product of the five people we spend the most time with. Although the accuracy of that number is open for debate, those we spend time around are going to influence how we live our lives, and therefore whether we are likely to enjoy good health. Seek out people who support your needs and goals. Specifically, seek out people who encourage and motivate you to live a healthy diabetes reversing lifestyle. People who respect your goals and efforts. Even the best meaning people can sabotage your efforts if they harbour a lot of misconceptions. So educate them by sharing these presentations and anything else you think is essential knowledge. Spend time with people who can empathise and who have similar goals, whether or not that people happen to have type 2 diabetes. For example, get active with a friend or even in a group. Spend time with people who have shared some of your experiences and will accept you when you speak about your challenges and how they make you feel. Have positive role models, and in fact become a positive role model. That will make it much easier for you to live a healthy, happy life. Moving on to food. The news headlines abound with catchy titles about how this or that food or supplement will help with diabetes or with high blood pressure or some other condition. As welcome as these are, they often overstate the benefits and thereby lead people in the wrong direction. A diet is more than the sum of its parts. Foods are not drug replacements and neither are supplements. However, a healthy diet, and even better, a healthy lifestyle, can often replace the need for drug therapy. So it's important to recognize that having nuts or ginger or olive oil won't magically supercharge your insulin sensitivity. When we focus on eating more health promoting foods, we inevitably displace and even replace some foods that are harmful. And that may be just as important. Also people, even if they all have type 2 diabetes in common, are going to vary a lot in terms of what works. Having said that, research has identified several things that are likely to help you maintain or improve insulin sensitivity and thereby glucose control. Perhaps the most obvious thing is restricting carbohydrates. Please watch module four of our Eat 101 series to see what happens to someone with type two diabetes when they eat a carbohydrate rich meal. Even if that meal is mostly complex carbohydrates or considered low GI. 
Do avoid trans fats and fill up on non-starchy vegetables. Eat healthy sources of fat like extra virgin olive oil, fatty fish and seafood. Go easy on the fruits as they're going to be high in sugar. Do use them as a natural sweetener though, especially berries. If you have any intolerance to gluten, removing this from your diet will make a big difference to your diabetes as well. Cutting back on carbohydrates will already mean reducing or eliminating some key sources of gluten. Adding unsweetened, unsalted nuts, vinegar, fresh herbs, cinnamon, ginger, and especially turmeric into your diet all or most days will also help reduce insulin resistance and or simply improve your general health. The list of foods and spices that some will claim help with diabetes is long, but the research in humans is often limited or non-existent. So focus on the well-known big ticket items, namely reducing your carbohydrates, eliminating trans fats, and then adding in plenty of fresh vegetables and some healthy oils. When it comes to beverages, water is key. Water makes up a large portion of our bodies, a portion that tends to get less with age, but that makes getting adequate amounts of clean water even more important throughout the life cycle. As we get older, our sense of thirst becomes less reliable as an indicator to how much we need to drink. And many of us have a tendency to mistake thirst for hunger, no matter what our age. It's essential for our good health to stay well hydrated. And nothing beats well filtered and therefore clean water. You can always add a few slices of lime or lemon for flavour if plain water just isn't your thing. Now bottled water, although probably not unhealthy for us, is environmentally damaging due to the vast quantities of plastic produced. And it's basically a big con. Bottled water is usually just someone else's tap water. Even if it does come from a spring and contains some tiny amounts of minerals, you still need to get most of your minerals from food anyway. Save yourself the money and reduce the amount of plastic waste you produce by investing in a water filter. And drink from glass or steel. That covered a little bit about what to eat and drink. What about how to eat? The how is half the story. Recall that chronic stress is bad for our insulin sensitivity. It's also bad for our ability to digest and absorb and therefore make the best use of what we do eat. Stress makes our bodies prepare to fight or flee. One of the ways it prepares is by shunting blood toward our muscles and away from the internal organs that we need to digest and process food. Stress also distracts our minds, leading to mindless and often excessive eating. And that's a bad time to be eating. The opposite of the fight or flight state is often called rest and digest, and that name should really tell you everything you need to know. The time to eat is when we're relaxed. Now maybe there's too much going on in your life to ever feel truly relaxed. That's okay. That's something to work on. Just make a commitment for one meal a day to turn off the distractions, as vital as they may seem. Sit down. Take five slow, deep breaths. And then eat your food with as much focus on really experiencing it as you can muster. Smell it. Taste it. Savour it. And chew it until whatever you're eating is a decidedly liquid consistency before swallowing. These simple, though not necessarily easy acts, will do your digestion a world of good because your body will become more relaxed. Some people even change their food preferences after allowing themselves to truly experience what they eat, rather than simply wolfing it down and telling themselves that that's what they like. The word natural is largely meaningless when used by advertisers and manufacturers. Everyone has a sense of what natural means, but we all have different takes on what is and what is not natural. But there wasn't really a better term I could think of. So I'll stick to specific examples of how to reduce the amount of contaminants you're exposed to by keeping things natural. When it comes to preparing and storing food and beverages, use glass, untreated wood, 
steel and iron in favour of plastics, aluminium or non-stick options. Avoid using cast iron if you already have high iron levels. Drink and cook with filtered water. Grow your own food, eat organic if you can, and if nothing else, eat a broad variety of mostly fresh foods. Keep your home free of mould, dry and well ventilated. Get outside as often as possible, as the air is generally better outside than inside. Now, learning this surprised me too. When you do clean, opt for natural cleaning agents using things like vinegar, lemon juice, salt, coconut oil and baking soda. If you regularly use a moisturiser, consider replacing it with coconut or olive oil. And cut down on cosmetics. Replace what you can't live without with the best options you can get your hands on. What about weight loss? When it comes to type 2 diabetes and a host of other chronic health conditions, lose weight is the mantra of most health and nutrition professionals. And they're right, but they're all so wrong. Yes, there is plenty of research to show that diabetes improves or even goes into full remission when people shed sufficient fat. Diets work, at least in the short term. Bariatric surgery works, sometimes for years on end. So why do we take a different approach at Built for Motion? Well, there are two reasons. The first is that the positive effects of restrictive diets last only a little bit longer than they do. And bariatric surgery, depending on the type, is pretty hard to undo. So if you're happy with better health, they may be a good option. But if you want great health, they may actually present a barrier. The second reason is that both highly restrictive diets, often called very low calorie diets, and bariatric surgery work faster than they should if it was all about weight reduction. Insulin resistance and blood glucose improve dramatically after just 48 hours of fasting, or a week on a low calorie diet, or a few days after bariatric surgery. These aren't long enough to lose a lot of weight, and a big proportion of that weight loss will be water. That means there's more to the story than weight loss or even total fat loss. I have another presentation that goes into this in more detail that I do for diabetes support groups. So look out for an upload if this is something you want to know more about. For now, recall from previous presentations that insulin signals our bodies to store fat. When we're insulin resistant, our insulin is high most if not all of the time. Two signals they get through are the signal to convert glucose to fat and the signal to store fat. When you become more insulin sensitive, your average insulin will go down and fat reduction will come more easily. Getting too focused on weight reduction is ultimately counterproductive. As your body gets healthier, it will shed that excess fat and it will do so without the risk of ending up with a slowed metabolism or the discomfort of severe deprivation that restrictive diets can bring. So in summary, when it comes to the insulin sensitivity tug of war, in the red corner we have excess fat in and around the organs, poor sleep regularity, quality and quantity, infection or other promoters of inflammation like smoking and excess alcohol, chronic stress, environmental pollutants and contaminants, excessive sedentary time, dehydration, and high carbohydrates and trans fats. On the other hand, in the green corner, we have a good night's sleep, breaking up sedentary time and being physically active, exercise, focused relaxation, staying well hydrated with clean water, time spent in nature, reducing exposure to toxins, cutting back on carbohydrates, and making time to eat mindfully. Every little bit helps, and a lot of the suggestions provided in this presentation are geared toward achieving more than one thing. For example, spending time in nature addresses the problems of indoor air pollution, and also helps with relaxation and stress reduction, as well as providing an opportunity to be physically active. Make one change at a time. Make it small. Make it something you're confident you can do. And then build up the changes gradually as your confidence and your abilities improve.
To learn more about nutrition, watch our Eat 101 series in which I tackle issues like the jargon of nutrition so that you and your healthcare team stop talking past each other without even knowing it. That series also clears up several common myths and misconceptions to let you take better control of your diet and thereby your health and your happiness. To learn more about physical activity and exercise, check out the Move 101 series. Here we also tackle some basic jargon and help you build a foundation of knowledge that will let you make the most of the time you have to be physically active. Also, for more information on any of the Built for Motion Health themes of Think, Move, Breathe, Eat and Recover, or to find out more about our health coaching service, simply visit, simply visit www.builtformotion.co.nz.